And we're seeing those slides okay? Yeah. Awesome. All right. So um, just a moment, I'm going to hand it over to Allison, our guest speaker for tonight. But uh, if you haven't heard much about our New Jersey uh, Student Climate Challenge, I have a quick few background pieces of information. So the challenge is geared for students in grades 6 through 12 at public schools in the state of New Jersey. Um, we're hoping that under the guidance of the wonderful teachers listening to this call, um, you will be working with your students in teams of two to 12-ish. Um, we don't want the teams too, too large, just because we want to make sure that every student gets to have their voice heard uh, on the team as they take on a climate action project. And those projects can help to um, focus in on either a community or a school project that is going to work to uh, either address the human causes of climate change or the impacts of climate change on our environment. And as a part of the project, uh, we're asking students to create a digital story, which is kind of telling us a little bit more about why this was an impactful project for you, how you did, what you did, um, and what were some of those successes, hopefully. The timeline for this, over the month of February and sneaking into March tonight, uh, we had educational sessions for both students and teachers. Um, all of those were recorded and are available on a link, which I will post in the chat, um, but they're available on the Sustainable Jersey for Schools uh, YouTube page, uh, as well as their homepage. There's plenty of links there. But between now and April 1st, we're asking the students to be working on those amazing climate action projects and working on those videos to submit by April 1st. Over the month of April and into May, we'll be reviewing those submissions and then announce the finalists to which we will have a award ceremony in June posted it at the Drum Thwacket Mansion with uh, First Lady and Governor Murphys. And uh, yeah, we'll get to award some great uh, grants to schools um, to recognize the amazing work that the students have completed. And without any further ado, I will gladly hand things over to Allison. Thank you. Let me stop my share. Here we go, all yours. Up. Here it is, you're not letting me optimize for video clips. It did earlier. Let's try this again. Hmm, not sure what that's going to do. It's not letting me pick the same things um, when we tried before, Joanna. So we'll just see what happens. Um, you see my slide? Yep, I see, I see New Jersey. Cool. Okay, so hello. I'm a project director for School, school Sustainability with New Jersey Audubon. Um, this organization is New Jersey's oldest and largest conservation agency with several nature centers throughout the state. Before we get started with tonight's presentation, I'd like you to view the natural regions and counties displayed before you. And in the chat, can you describe your location on this map? Well, you know what? We don't have to do chat. We can just say it because guys are right here. So to tell me where you are on this map, physically located. Hello. So I, I am. In, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just making sure you hear me. Once, go. <laughs> I'm in um, the intercoastal plain, but I grew up in Piedmont and Piedmont into the Highlands, and most recently lived both in kind of maybe the Pine Barrens, but also Piedmont. So I've been up and down the state of New Jersey over the past mm, ten years. Joanna, what about you? So I'm in the intercoastal plain. I'm in Gloucester County. Oh, you're by me. Nice. What town in Gloucester County? Uh, Elk Township. Oh, I'm in Washington Township. Wow, very, very cool. close. My sister lives in Washington Township. Very nice. Um, you're and, <laughs> oh, yeah, Paisley, where are you? Does she see where she is? Right, right here, Paisley. We're in the Gloucester County intercoastal plain where it's purple. We're and in and the purple where are you? Thing. <laughs> I'm in Middlesex County in the intercoastal plain, and I've been here my whole life. And then Dale's all the way at the bottom in Cape May. But I used to be in Morris County up in the Highlands. Another person who's gone across the state. Very cool. Um, so welcome. My name is Allison Mulch, and this map of New Jersey represents our home, our shared home. 
Tonight, I'm going to be talking about protecting New Jersey's habitats from climate change through student action. And I'm here to talk to you about how students and people like you and me are coming together in their schools and communities to address an important challenge of our time. The issue is climate change. Increasingly, people are recognizing our shared responsibility to take action to protect our natural habitats and resources and address the causes of climate change. The DEP, New Jersey's Department of Environmental Protection, they created their first report on climate change, which was published over the summer of 2020, summarizing the current state of knowledge with data that makes indisputable New Jersey's vulnerability to climate change. The report identifies and presents the best available science and existing data regarding the current and anticipated environmental effects of climate change. Exploring data from this report, you're going to learn the impacts of climate change on New Jersey's ecosystems, how to integrate New Jersey specific information into lessons, and some resources are going to be available to assist. As atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases increase, New Jersey will experience significant direct and secondary changes to its environment. These include increases in temperature, variability of precipitation, sea, precipitation frequency and intensity of storms, sea level rise, ocean acidification, and associated impacts to ecological systems and natural resources shown here. So we're gonna talk about each of these a bit, air quality, uh, water resources, agriculture, forests, wetlands, terrestrial carbon sequestration systems, freshwater systems, marine systems, and algal blooms. Algal blooms, I was told that's how to pronounce it today. Um, so each of you, what can you tell me a little bit of when you look at this graph? What are you seeing here? I am seeing an upward trend in an average temperature. At least that's what it looks like to me. Yes, New Jersey is warming and it's warming faster than the rest of the Northeast region and the world. Since 1895, New Jersey's annual temperatures have increased by three and a half degrees Fahrenheit. Unprecedented warming is projected for the 21st century with, with average annual temps increasing between 4.1 and 5.7 degrees by the year 2050. And heat waves are expected to impact larger areas with more frequency and longer duration during that time. That might seem bad, and you're going to hear some more dense information in the following presentation. But before packing your bags, know that your students can take actions to reduce the impacts predicted in the report and shown in the following slides. Before getting into more information, what are some actions that you know students are already taking in schools and communities? It doesn't have to be your schools. How about some um, sustainable Jersey schools? What do you know they're doing? I know some of the action projects that were submitted last year for the New Jersey Student Climate Challenge, um, students really resonated around the idea of um, going either meatless or eating less meat in their diets, which was a kind of a different one. Um, I mean, <clears throat> um, I'm really excited to, to hopefully see some anti-idling projects come in because I think that's an easy kind of uh, awareness campaign that would be really awesome as well. Fantastic. That would be great to see. Um, so the, the photo here on the left, that was taken near Port Newark in New Jersey. Climate change is setting the stage for New Jersey to have worse air quality. It's going to contribute to an increase in air pollution that's going to have impacts on human health. Ozone pollution has been described as sunburn for the lungs, and it can be life-threatening for the roughly 1 million New Jerseyans diagnosed with asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And asthma flare-ups are the main reason kids with asthma miss school, um, and they miss a lot. The CDC says that about 13 million school days are missed each year because of kids with asthma. In addition, plant life is particularly susceptible and will result in increased environmental degradation, such as damage to crops and forests. But I told you we're going to hear about things that kids can do. And during a summer professional development workshop that New Jersey Audubon hosted in Jersey City, teachers learned that lichen is an outdoor air quality indicator. Bringing this information back to his students, teacher Albert Padilla from Jersey City took his students to observe lichen found on street trees around their urban school. 
Student inquiries furthered their investigation of air quality to inside their school, looking for molds and other allergens, as well as finding that smog was entering their windows from idling school buses. Their solution was to create air filters for their windows using recycled materials, which they tested for effectiveness. Next, they tackled that school bus issue that you just talked about with some anti-idling campaigns. I think you'll like this next um, student example as well. These are some things that we realize people experience in our school and that also correlates with bad indoor air quality. We did contact air sampling to test what was going on in the hallways to talk to the prices. For the corner of the hallway between lockers, there was a large amount of mold here and there was also a significant amount of mold in several spots. So our plan is to remove the carpets from the first floor hallway as well as the second floor and basement level and install high hanging planters to improve the indoor air quality. During quarantine, Leonia's custodial staff continued with the students' plans for removal of the carpets and tile installation. That was quite impressive. Um, pictured here is Stokes State Forest. New Jersey will put a greater demand on its water supplies as human populations, forests, wetlands, and wildlife require more water in warmer temperatures. Temperature increases will lead to longer growing seasons, which then will require more water for irrigation use for crops, nurseries, golf courses, and just outdoor residential use. Increased temperatures will also result in New Jersey experiencing higher winter stream flows due to more winter rain and a reduction in snow accumulation. Reduced winter snow accumulation may ultimately lead to reduced snow melt and lower spring stream flows. New Jersey's water quality will be impaired as extreme precipitation events increase runoff, bringing excess sediment and contaminants to New Jersey streams. This excess of nutrients along with New Jersey's increased temperatures will lead to eutrophic conditions and an increased potential to stimulate rapid and excessive growth of harmful algal blooms. Saltwater intrusion could impair the water quality of groundwater aquifers in coastal areas that are already stressed from overpumping. And sea level rise may also threaten the quality of surface water systems as salt fronts move upstream and, are, and, impacts, and impact freshwater intakes aquifer reef charge areas, and aquatic ecology. A sea level rise of 2.4 feet will result in the salt front from the Delaware River moving almost six miles, almost seven miles upstream. Let me move my controls here, I can't see. Existing treatment infrastructure in New Jersey is not designed to treat elevated salt levels and drinking water standards do not exist for the primary components of salt water. Stormwater management systems will also need to be modified to accommodate more intense precipitation and increased occurrence of flooding. Slide. Older cities in the state, like Newark and Patterson, use combined systems to handle sewer waste and stormwater runoff. When those systems are overwhelmed by heavy rain, sewage is emptied directly into waterways. As temperatures increase, Earth's atmosphere can hold more water vapor, which leads to greater potential for precipitation. Currently, New Jersey receives an average of 46 inches of precipitation each year, and precipitation in New Jersey is expected to increase by 4 to 11 percent by the year 2050. The intensity and frequency of precipitation events is anticipated to increase due to climate change, and droughts may occur more frequently as well due to expected changes in precipitation patterns. The size and frequency of floods will increase as annual precipitation increases and tropical storms will have the potential to increase in intensity due to warmer atmosphere and warmer oceans that occur with climate change. On the left, students at a uh, school green fair, they demonstrated how native plants can act as filters and do a better job holding on to water and soil with their longer root systems. Top right, students from the George L. Catron Boone School in Long Branch are proud of the greenhouse they constructed by repurposing water bottles they collected. And on the bottom right, students created an activity, and not that one. On the uh, bottom right, students from Rock, Frog Pond Elementary School installed a rain gardens using native plants and added stormwater drainage systems in their courtyard. Sea levels are rising in New Jersey at roughly twice the global average. By 2050, there's a 50% chance that sea level rise will meet or exceed 
1.4 feet to 2.1 feet. And those levels increased to almost five feet by the end of the century. Places like Atlantic City are increasingly threatened by sunny day flooding with water levels now high enough that it only takes a high tide for the bay to spill into neighborhoods. It's very likely that Atlantic City will experience sunny day flooding 95 days per year. And that could go up to 355 days per year um, by the year 2100. Pictured on top are students from Marine Academy of Science and Technology. Um, they were planting sea beach amaranth, which is vital for dune formation and sets seed when it dies. Sandy Hook had large, well-developed dune systems to protect the area until Superstorm Sandy washed those dunes along with all the seeds inward. And so the same sand had to be replaced in hopes of retrieving some of those seeds. But the populations, they only come back at about 50% and it was a real concern to the students. So they researched this problem and installed plugs to help stabilize the existing dunes. New Jersey's agriculture sector may be impacted by longer growing seasons, wetter conditions in early season, delayed spring plantings, warmer and drier conditions mid-season, and an increased need for irrigation to sustain the health of the crops, pasture land, and livestock. The productivity of New Jersey's dairy cows is predicted to reduce, resulting in loss of the industry. New Jersey farmers will increase use of pesticides as agricultural pests and weeds will move northward, resulting in additional environmental concerns. Students can take actions by learning green farming practices, harvesting rainwater by collecting rain in rain barrels for use in their gardens and creating soil with compost. New Jersey is the garden state and is recognized for its blueberry and cranberry crops, which need colder winter temperatures to produce fruit for the following spring. Farmers in New Jersey have already noted a shift in crop productivity. It'll be really dry for quite a while, and then it all of a sudden, it seems like all the rain will come at once. We transplanted five miles of potatoes. That night, it rained five inches. So when we went to the farm the next day, our potato field was then a pond. There was actually ducks swimming in it. We lost 80% of our potato crop that year. Uh, because of the five inches that it rained. And an ideal amount of um, precipitation per week is about an inch and a quarter. So it rained um, in just a few hours, a month's worth of rain. We can start to mitigate climate change by taking individual action at home and school. Students can be seen here testing out farming techniques, learning about the importance of native plants and habitats, learning about sustainable agriculture practices, and how to create and maintain healthy soil. Um, I'll just mention it. You saw a picture there. That was Maura Sweeter. She was New Jersey Audubon Sustainability Ambassador last year from Stockton. Um, so I'm excited that I was able to use her. She created all these presentations, all these um, videos. So forests are likely to be stressed by instances of drought and expanded range of pests. The stress is expected to be amplified by the non-climate stressors that forests already face from human decisions. The moisture tolerant species like maples in New Jersey's forests will be stressed by rising temperatures, where the drought tolerant species like oaks and pines will be better suited for the impacts of climate change. Pest species are expected to take advantage of warmer temperatures and disperse into forests that had not before experienced the pressures of those pests. Increasing temperatures with less frost events are extending the habitat for pests like the southern pine beetle. The beetles invade the tree's main stem. Thousands of pairs may attack and kill a single tree. New Jersey's pine forests are at risk. Students from the uh, Millstone Township Elementary School took up a similar cause when they formed a spotted lanternfly team to educate and eradicate the invasive pests from their community. They engaged the community in problem-solving activities to create traps to reduce the number of lanternflies at each stage of their life cycle. Um, as New Jersey's climate becomes more similar to, to Southern conditions, the forest composition will comparatively shift. This figure shows the, important value, the importance value assigned to each tree species. The species with the higher importance are expected to be more suited to climate growing conditions in the years indicated. I'll give you um, a, a minute or two to take a look at this chart. Does anybody wanna um, say something about what they're noticing? 
I'm sad to say that I see sugar maples there because I know several uh, maple syrup farmers that are going to struggle if those trees aren't going to survive. And they put a lot of years into that crop. Interesting for me, um, because I live in uh, Cape May County. So the um, sweet gum and persimmon, um, those and, and the southern red oak, um, you know, are are all over the place down here in Cape May County, but not in North Jersey. So it's interesting to see that those species will it will potentially increase over time. Yeah, and I know that um, townships are are when they're looking at purchasing new um, new tree species. For the past few years, they've been told, you know, think about what's planted in Myrtle Beach. That's something that might end up doing well here. So for it's been several years now that uh, municipalities have been already been planning out this way. Um, through learning about forests, it's an eco schools pathway. Students can research and identify trees calculate carbon sequestration and add trees to their communities and school grounds. Um, to, in learning to identify trees or any species that I've mentioned, statewide students can be engaging in a bio blitz, learning to make observations and identify species through citizen science apps, including iNaturalist and Seek. And I wanna show you how both of those work. Um, in this first one minute clip on how to use iNaturalist, there is just, I'll just say there's one part where it talks about taking a picture further away and it shows it shows all of Earth. That's not the point. It meant to just take a, a full picture of the tree. So here we go. iNaturalist is an app that allows you to identify species that you find anywhere you go. All you have to do is take pictures of the plant or animal you're trying to identify and then upload them to the app. It is important to try and take at least three pictures. These pictures should all capture a different angle of the species. It is good to have one up close image capturing the details and one further away. Then you put in your location. Putting in your location helps the app narrow down the potential species. After you upload your images and locations to the app, iNaturalist will provide you with a list of suggested species. The first species listed is wheelbug. I took pictures of eggs, so let's see if there are any pictures of wheelbug eggs listed. Here I can see a picture of wheelbug eggs on a tree that look very similar to the pictures I took. I'm pretty sure that wheelbug eggs are what I found today, but let's go back and check another species to be sure. Here I can see another picture of eggs, but the wheel bug eggs definitely match my images more closely. So I'll upload them to iNaturalist. In a few hours or a few days, someone who's verified on the app can confirm my findings. Um, great, and I will show you, here's a second app that um, is more enjoyed by elementary school and middle school students. I do see even some high school teachers who prefer this, this app to the other one as well. When you first open the Seek app, make sure your location is accurate so that you are able to identify the species. Note that sometimes if there is an invasive species, Seek will have a hard time recognizing that species due to the location parameters. Once you've confirmed your location, hit the green camera button at the bottom of the screen. Bring your camera close to the plant you're trying to identify. Walk around to try and get different angles. As you can see, Seek automatically identified this plant as the American holly. And since I already cited the species, it's saying that I recited it. And if you look on the Seek app, you can find out more information about the plant that was identified. Seek is great to instantly identify plants, but sometimes Seek has a hard time identifying the plant that you're looking at specifically. As you can see, I'm maneuvering my camera to get different angles. And in a second, I'll step back and take a look at the whole plant to try to give Seek a better angle. Unfortunately, it's not able to identify the specific species. And this would be an example of a time when it's good to take a few close-up pictures 
and upload them to iNaturalist. Um, pictured here are the Meadowlands to Sea Caucus. High salt marsh is shifting to middle and low marsh as habitats are regularly flooded and giving way to species that are more resilient to sea level rise. The result is the expected loss of habitat for species like the red mussels and crabs and the eventual conversion of marsh habitat to mudflats and open water. Saltwater inundation has already caused New Jersey to experience coast forests where stands of dead trees surrounded by transitional marshes. Ghost forests develop when trees begin to take in salt water due to sea level rise, and they slowly start to die. The Atlantic white cedar, it's a globally rare species, and it's one of the trees that has been directly impacted by rising sea level. Pictured here are students from the Cape May Vocational School. The bridge they stand on is normally used to reach their boat dock from a pathway through the marsh behind their school. Access to the bridge is increasingly cut off from elevated water levels. Students learn that tidal marshes provide a host of valuable functions to communities, protecting from some of the forces of coastal storms acting as a frontline buffer and provide absorption and storage of carbon. As all plants do, wetland plants take up or sequester carbon dioxide from the air and use it to grow, to make more stems and leaves, roots and rhizomes, flowers and seeds. As these plant parts die, they are slowly and continually buried. This plant matter remains underground as peat, which is comprised of carbon that living plants remove from the carbon dioxide, the most significant greenhouse gas. As long as the peat remains saturated, as it is in tidal wetland, the carbon remains stored underground. Because tidal marshes store more carbon than they emit, protecting and restoring them are important tools for mitigating global warming and by extension, slowing sea level rise. New evidence has emerged that even living shorelines, even living shoreline projects constructed primarily to reduce erosion using native, native marsh plants have carbon storage benefits. Since a portion of, of Cape May Votex school grounds are identified as wetland habitat, students studied the changes occurring by creating a baseline environmental audit for the wetlands environment, making observations and collecting data at local wetlands um, monitoring the system through citizen science and creating a wetlands field guide. They also did a project, whoop, let me come back, sorry. They also did a project with um, their engineering students to create a floating walkway. I don't know if they created it yet. They came up with the ideas. They looked at different materials. So that project, along with several others, they are um, all documented as examples in a joint publication that New Jersey Audubon worked on with the New Jersey's Department of Environmental Protection. Um, it was called the Teacher Guide to Building Ecological Solutions for Environmental Hazards. In a collaboration, but also with the National Wildlife Federation and several New Jersey educators, this guide was created for, for creating problem-based and place-based learning in science with an emphasis on STEM integration. It was based on the Eco School seven step framework, um, and students conducted environmental audits, collected baseline data, and created action plans and became empowered to implement the solutions. Um, all, the, all the resources that were used by the teachers, some of the teachers that I'm talking about, you can look every one of those um, uh, lesson plans up in here as well. So, terrestrial carbon sequestration in systems. The loss of coastal wetlands and forest habitats to climate change will result in carbon losses and increase New Jersey's net greenhouse gas emissions. It's likely to facilitate expansion of invasive plant species. 29% um, of New Jersey's bird species are vulnerable, including the goldfinch. And salt marsh sparrows, they could become extinct by the year 2040. Almost one third of New Jersey's bird species are vulnerable to climate change, including the American goldfinch. Bird populations rely on temperatures for mating cues, and shorebirds and other migratory bird species must arrive and depart from their breeding grounds in synchronization with the peak food and nesting site availability. Shifting temperatures across seasons could alter the life cycle events of bird species so that they're no longer synchronized and lead to lower reproductive rates for migratory birds. Non-migratory birds will also be impacted by mismatches in food and nesting site availability due to changes in precipitation and temperature. Um, one action that students across the state are already doing is they're creating certified wildlife habitats 
Um, you can also do this at your home or at any places in the community. You just need to provide these five things, food, water, cover, places to raise young, and um, use sustainable practices. So um, this picture was providing, uh, I'm sorry, I'm reading a long, long, long run. Providing cover with plants is largely about how you plant your garden or yard. Plant densely like this photo and you provide plenty of cover. Planting densely doesn't mean your yard needs to look messy or overly wild either. If you plant in large patches of native species and practice good gardening design, your natural wildlife habitat garden can be beautiful just like this one. Um, here's all different things that can be used for cover. You can have wooded areas, um, you can have ground cover, rock piles, um, roosting boxes, shrubs, thicket, evergreens, quite a lot that you can possibly be using, especially at your schools. And places to raise young. Um, so if you can leave them, mature or dead trees, students can be creating nesting boxes. You can have host plants for caterpillars um, and have a water garden or a pond and use sustainable practices. Cats are non-native. Outdoor cats kill large amount of native wildlife from frogs and toads. Um, outdoor cats has caused the extinction of many species around the world. So keeping cats indoors keeps them healthy and uh, keeps our wildlife safe and protected. Reptile and amphibian populations of New Jersey may experience shifts in distribution, range, reproductive ecology, and habitat availability. Increased temperatures could lead to changes in mating, nesting, reproduction, and foraging behaviors of species, including a change in sex ratios in reptiles with temperature-dependent sex determination. An increase in droughts throughout New Jersey will decrease the availability of freshwater habitats, such as vernal pools, vernal ponds for amphibians. Sea level rise may further decrease the amount of available habitat. New Jersey's marine mammal populations will be impacted by a shift in distribution of, of prey sources due to ocean warming. Thin fish will be impacted through shifts in species spatial distribution, altered food availability, decreased survival due to changes in acidity and dissolved oxygen levels, and loss of habitat. Profitable fisheries like the summer flounder, which is the largest recreational fish species in New Jersey, could experience declines as water quality changes occur in bays and estuaries. Summer flounder and black sea bass may be impacted as a potential for hypoxic events in the increase in New Jersey. New Jersey's shellfish industry will be impacted as shellfish species, including hard clams, scallops, oysters, they'll develop thinner and frailer shells due to ocean acidification and are stress, stressed from increased precipitation, leading to reduced salinity and harmful bacteria. New Jersey is likely to experience the spread of non-native and invasive plant and animal species if new climate and habitats allows them to outcompete native species and rapidly reproduce and adapt. Clinging jellyfish serve as an example where climate change improved environmental conditions for invasive species. Similarly, fishermen are now reporting fish species like the sheep's head, cobia, and triggerfish earlier in the year and with increasing regularity. Harmful algal blooms may also increase as changes to precipitation patterns lead to increased surface water nutrients and eutrophic conditions that favor rapid and excessive growth for blooms. So I just have here, um, this is a link to the New Jersey Student Learning Standards um, you, for climate change resources. So teachers should now be going to this website and getting familiar with the new climate change standards that are going to be coming out um, and expected to be um, starting in se September of 2022. And while the COVID-19 pandemic continues to impact our communities, this crisis has shown us the interconnected nature as well as the inequities of our health, climate, social, and financial systems. Like the virus, the climate crisis is a problem of exponential growth that require big changes to ensure the most severe impacts are minimized. A key component will be education that supports all aspects of building a more resilient, equitable, and sustainable future. EcoSchools USA challenges students to think creatively and critically about environmental health and sustainability problems in their schools and community and become empowered to develop place-based solutions. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. 
that's my presentation. If you guys have any questions, any thoughts. Sure, well, while, if anybody is thinking of any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. I'm gonna do just a quick kind of, um, uh, kind of where things stand with the climate challenge. And then I will turn things back over to Allison to help address any questions if anybody um, has any. So I'll quickly share my screen as well. There we go. All right, and so as you can see from this wide array of um, sessions that we held for students, um, actually a number of the topics that Allison was talking about and referring to have direct uh, connections to some of these sessions that we had experts from across the state of New Jersey give lots more details from everything about um, thinking about food waste and how that contributes to climate change and how we can avoid food waste in our homes, in our schools, in our communities, to thinking about tree planting and, and native planting of native uh, plants and how that helps with climate resilience to um, thinking about uh, saving energy and energy efficiency at your school, but also speaking out and getting your voice heard and kind of creating those awareness campaigns so that you're not only bringing new information for your own knowledge, but also for those around you as well and how you can really broaden your impact um, to, to take action on the climate crisis. So all of these sessions are available, the recordings are available at the website. I will drop the bit.ly link in the chat um, once more. And we also had um, tonight is our fifth and final professional development that we held for teachers over the past month. Um, everything from kind of like thinking about how to participate in the New Jersey Student Climate Challenge to thinking about uh, bringing more climate change, a a, even a deeper dive to that website that Allison referred to at the very end about from the New Jersey Department of Ed. Um, kind of uh, both the igniting change in your classroom and integrating climate change into your curricula were two deep dives into um, thinking about two fantastic websites for uh, educational resources related to climate change and taking climate action, which are subject to climate and the clean network, um, their resources that are widely available, as well as the many resources that are now uh, linked through the New Jersey Department of Education. I did drop that link into the chat. So lots of great, great resources out there from the recordings of all, all of our past sessions. Additionally, on the bit.ly link, there are uh, teacher's guides, students' guides, lots of resources for helping you to think about uh, how to guide students through this process and to take action on the many uh, uh, critical problems that we're facing, um, environmental issues that we're facing as a result of climate change and kind of some of the positive actions that students working together can take. Um, and then just my... Uh, if you are watching this, teachers, uh, please register uh, at the bit.ly link I will um, drop in the chat. But what that does, it doesn't uh, commit you to submitting a, a student submission, but it does help us to keep you in the loop about, you know, if there's changes, new resources become available, so on and so forth. And then finally, um, there's the bit.ly link, but I will drop it in the chat as well. Um, the, our socials, email to contact us if you have any questions. I will leave that up for just a moment, but, and then I will drop my screen share so that we can see each other. And if anybody has any questions for Allison or, there we go. Let me just drop the bit.ly in the chat. And then I, what, uh, my question for you, Allison, if nobody else has a question. <laughs> well, it's just us. So. <laughs> Comments. Uh, oh, sure, Dale, go sure. ahead. You, you can take first. Uh, that, yeah, I, but that was really great, Allison. Thank you so much. I mean, I it really um, it laid out a lot of content, a lot of information, but also um, a lot of ways for uh, us as teachers to get our students involved in things. So I really like seeing what. Uh, some students have already done because there's there's models out there, right? So it's it's really we can we can really see that people have already started working towards this and really started getting their students involved. So thank you for for both the the really dense content, which is fantastic for our own background, but also those examples, those wonderful examples of this from the students. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I know between the examples that Allison shared and Eco Schools examples in New Jersey Audubon links and Sustainable Jersey for Schools has like, there's so many wonderful examples about what students and schools across the entire state have been able to accomplish to increase their local um, sustainability efforts. Uh, so really great projects. Uh, that can are all searchable, lots of information about how different schools and classrooms, uh, after school groups, during school groups uh, have all really been able to make positive contributions. So um, what I was going to ask you, Allison, is what's one of your favorite projects? I know we got to see a couple of the projects that were highlighted um, by, yeah. by you and some some of your your friends and family at, at New Jersey Audubon, but um, What's been one of the most exciting projects that you've seen recently? So, well, recently that's that's a that's a little harder because oh, yeah, COVID. COVID's a little tricky. But, but one of one of my favorite projects um, was because um, I always believe you learn best when you fail first, <laughs> um, because it's it's part of that whole design engineering process. And it was the students at the George L. Catrambone Elementary School. Um, in their first design for that greenhouse, they were just using regular size water bottles that they had collected. And they stacked them, put a roof and a door on it, and a wing came and blew the whole thing down. So they redesigned <laughs> and they realized, oh no, we need to use bigger water bottles with bigger holes because um, we're going to put PVC pipe through this to create um, a better construction. So I've actually been inside that greenhouse. It's 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 lived. It's still there. And well, I don't know. I haven't been there in a few years, but I know it made it a couple of years. I know the first lady was inside that greenhouse as well. Um, so that was just a really fun project. There was also a project where kids in Jersey City, um, it was three girls called themselves the Trapasquitos, and Zika had been in the news, and um, they were worried with warmer temperatures from climate change that. The, that species would migrate its way up and be a problem here in New Jersey. So they decided to come up with a design for trapping mosquitoes. Um, it's the CO2 that we're breathing out that they're attracted to, but they can get that same result from rotting fruit. So they put rotting fruit in the bottom and created a trap, a floating trap um, that was able to then um, draw in uh, mosquitoes from holes they put in the PV site, PVC pipe and the mosquitoes would go down to that CO2 and not be able to come back up. Um, the girls just kept making it a better design and a better design because then they attached fans to extend the range that was drawing in these mosquitoes. And then they said, oh, well, we need a, a solar panel so that we're not using electricity in our design. Um, and then they took it to the top of that learning pyramid. They taught other students how to recreate that design. So it was just an excellent example, um, extremely creative teachers. They were using a reservoir that was um, no longer being used for the city's drinking water across the street as their extended learning, outdoor learning classroom. So just a really fantastic project. Great kids. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so many different ways of kind of bringing it into the classroom, but, but yeah, no, I agree that that, you know, that iterative process of like how how far can things go wrong, but you learn so much through those steps and and through that productive failure that that is is good to experience sometimes. And we can't those, do it right the first time. It's not fun. <laughs> those girls were middle school girls, and to hear them speak, they were so proud of their design and can speak so well to what they had mm -hmm. accomplished. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all because of that learning, that repeating design um, that they, they kept having to revisit question themselves. So um, that's why I'm involved with this work. It's all about great education. Um, mm -hmm. So love to see what other kids can do. Great. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate all of the fantastic information you were able to share with us tonight. I'm sure it will be very useful to, to teachers to thinking about the scope of the impacts that we're going to be experiencing as a result of climate change here in the state of New Jersey, but also thinking about what we can do about it. So thank you so much. Uh, have a great night, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night, everyone.